Okay, you can see my screen. I can see we should be live, and I'm just going to do an audio test here. Bill? Yeah, yeah, we're good. And it's one fifteen, and we're good to go. Hi, Dave. Hey, Rob. All right. Well, we've got lots of people out there, so I'm going to hand it over to Bill, and we'll get started. Awesome. Thanks so much. Um, so we're live streaming now. Um, it is eleven fifteen, but for those people that are just tuning in, um, we are recording this um, just in case there are topics that you want to uh, refer to. Um, we also will be posting this later through all our sources so that you can revisit or share with other parents who weren't able to meet at this time. Uh, we'll go through a little bit of introductions as we go through, but I do want to give some context um, to these sessions is that first, this is a, um, a way of our, our board to address um, all the feedback and questions and uh, considerations that we've been hearing from everyone. Um, during this very fluid and sort of a stressful and new situation for all. So for ourselves, um, my name is Bill Corcoran. I am a coordinator with Learning Technologies Department. And um, my colleague, uh, Rob Long, will introduce himself in just a bit of time. You might be able to see on screen. Yeah, I think he's there. Um, he will be popping in to, uh, and we'll be splitting the, the session here as well. So again, these are two virtual sessions for our parents. It can be applicable to anybody who doesn't have a child in the virtual school, elementary school or academy. Um, there are workflows that will support, especially for schools that do go uh, virtual for periods of time and for those just using workspace in general. Before we get started, um, I do want to recognize that our school board respectfully acknowledges that we are located on the ancestral, traditional, and unceded Indigenous territory of the Algonquin peoples, on whose territory we pray, learn, play, and work. And of course, um, as we have so many things going on in our minds and our lives, uh, to take a moment to just touch base and uh, ground ourselves uh, together as a, as a school community as we move to move forward together. So um, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. God of hope, comfort and restore all who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. May they know the power of your healing love. Make us willing agents of your compassion and strengthen us as we share in making people whole. Amen. Our Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Okay, so as I mentioned, um, we will be looking at this kind of agenda for this time. We were aiming for about 30 minutes of presentation and then addressing questions, but I think it's um, seeing all the um, questions come in pre um, from the session we have been looking at over the last evening and so forth. So we have looked at themes and specific topics we need to address during this call and during this live stream. On the left hand side here, we do have questions. So if you enter on a separate tab, tinyurl.com slash OCSB tech questions, it will bring you to a Google form in which you can submit questions. And we will be uh, trying to monitor it the best we can throughout the session. And towards the end, trying to fill in the gaps of where we're looking at. So for this piece, we are going to be looking at um, the OCSB student uh, accounts and what it looks like in terms of password reset and your Chrome profiles. We'll give a little overview of the student portal, the Haparo workspace student dashboard, and then Rob will be jumping in and really looking at the parent portal um, and digital forms. And of course, we'll all be addressing those questions populated on the form as best as we can throughout the session. I do want to emphasize again who we are. Um, so Rob and I were asked to put on the session to support people um, in using the tools on the student portal to getting into uh, such as workspace in Hapara um, to getting into different items that we have there. We are both classroom teachers in a leadership position at our board. And for the purpose of this session, we are really looking at getting into the tools that we are provided and how we using it. Uh, we are using them to support our students in their learning. 
we know there are bigger questions about the tech itself and they're about different topics such as assessment and scheduling and all those things. And we want you to know that we are working collaboratively with our elementary, elementary virtual program and our virtual academy leadership teams um, to bring that feedback and making sure we are providing opportunities to address and communicate with our whole school parent community. This session is geared at the seven to 12 uh, panel, but if you will have kids in multiple age brackets, um, the presentation should be very similar, no matter which one you're looking at, but we will tailor specific examples in specific ways. And of course, we will look through and bring forward um, topics of next uh, for us to address with our CSPA parent partnerships and the feedback moving forward. So again, um, as this goes through, uh, please feel free to add some questions into our Google form, tinyurl.com slash OCSB tech questions. And it will bring you to a form that looks like this. Email address and your question. It's very simple to be able to do. Okay. So first of all, um, a lot of questions we got at the beginning of the year, um, and it may be more specific to our younger grades, but I do want to address it because it is questions that have come across our form, is that we do have an at ocsbstudent.ca email address for every student, which I'm sure right now um, you have identified of looking at. When we go on to the uh, student portal, I will show you how your child um, can reset their password should they uh, feel the need to. We always recommend changing it if they have the inkling that they that they need to. Um, in general, they carry over from year to year. There's nothing different for your child in seven to 12. And if they do need, uh, for instance, if there was an issue with them not remembering uh, their password at all to be able to change it, it would involve a communication with your classroom teacher at the school level to be able to do this. If they do email their classroom teacher, we may um, you may sometimes receive a, an additional communication out to make sure that the email did come from that student. Um, and so maybe it might be an, a, a phone call or a different uh, format to make sure that that is a kind of a check and balance, so to speak. And, and uh, right here, we will talk about uh, Google Chrome profiles, but um, we do get some questions on this form about the at ocsbstudent.google.ca Google account and Google Apps for Education. And so, Rob, we did talk about prompting over here just about what that means in terms of Google for Education and what that means to my child and their, their data and so forth. Hi, everybody, and welcome. For Google, we do get the question occasionally about security and uh, matters relating to personal information and where are they stored and what's our security level. So we have partnered and so has the province with Google. So we have worked with Google in particular with school boards and with the ministry lawyers to actually install a stronger contract with Google on how data is held and stored and then removed from Google. So it isn't your standard public contract. So if you go to Google and look up your public contract, that's a public contract. That's not what school boards use. So I just want everybody to be clear that we have worked with the privacy commissioners in Ontario and they have, they are absolutely supportive of what we're doing within our, our Google and some school boards are also using, you know, other cloud environments, but we run those all through the ministry. And like I said, we did establish legal contracts with Google about how we handle our data and where it's stored. Thanks, Rob. So from that standpoint, every student has their, their password given to them. And uh, if they're the younger grades um, or they don't ha have never received, if they're just coming into the school board, you just registered and came into our school board, it does need to be, um, the password needs to be reset, even though it would never have been formed but um, that would be involving reaching out to your classroom teacher and them resetting that password um, for you and your child and communicating that. Then moving forward, you would have access to the password reset tool on the student portal. So this is kind of is a little bit of um, going an overview of what I just mentioned, that if I don't, if I can't access my account, 
what do I do? Reach out to your classroom teacher and to um, reset that for your child. And just again, if you never got a password or you don't have one yet, um, same process as I just mentioned. Okay, so some of the things we're gonna be looking at is kind of talking about um, Chrome and Chrome profiles. Uh, we have received some questions about, well, my child is, uh, is logged into their ocsbstudent.ca account. However, they can't get into Hapara. And so this is what we call Chrome profiles. And we have been trying to share this as part of our CSPA updates um, through the virtual academies and elementary school program, through our, uh, our teachers and schools in physical in-person. Um, so just in case this um, occurs to you, I'm gonna pull in an example of a student view. So you're gonna see the intermediate uh, secondary student portal pop up on your screen. And there's two things that we're referring to. And Rob's gonna jump in in just a moment and talk about the difference between devices, whether being on a PC or a Chromebook. But what I mean um, when I look at my Chrome profiles, one, I'm using the Chrome browser. Um, so Google Chrome browser is downloaded to my device. And this might be an instance where I have a family um, laptop at home and I am using that to share amongst uh, different siblings or it's uh, something that you've purchased and people are sharing um, from parents, uh, personal accounts, work accounts, your uh, child's OCSB accounts, or even their um, regular accounts. So I can see that if I went to even just Google, uh, google.ca, I can see that when I'm logged in, um, and you could kind of see it on the other, on the student portal, but I wanted to show you that here, I, I click on the icon and it can say that I am logged in, it is managed, because we're going to talk, that's what Rob is going to talk about in a moment, that idea of being managed Chromebooks and versus regular Chromebooks. I'm logged into my Google account or the student's google.ca account. This is not the Chrome profile we're referring to. So you could be logged into Google, which is good, but you're not logged into Chrome, which allows you to get onto a lot of these um, the softwares that are on the student portal without having to log in. It's your Chrome profile that does this. So when I go to google.ca, I see that I'm logged into Google, but up top, I'm actually looking for my Google Chrome profile. And I, if I click on that, um, you can see that student 19 and different things that I have access to in my Google Chrome profile device is installed in there and I can flip between. So I'm asking that up here, you click on this and they also sign in to Google Chrome by adding a new user into that browser with the ocsbstudent.ca uh, Google credentials for your students. So I'm logged in two places on a um, PC or I guess a Mac using Chrome. And, but this is not what would occur if I was using a Chromebook because Chromebook would automatically do those both for you. So two birds, one stone on a Chromebook. But if I'm using a PC, like I mentioned, I would have um, two places I needed to be logged into, Google, as well as Google Chrome. And that will give me access to um, the softwares I need on the student portal. Rob, I'm gonna throw it to you right now to kind of talk about that managed, unmanaged Chromebook piece, uh, cause I know that's something that we've been asked about. Yep. So, hi you everyone. And uh, we, one of the things that we've done at the board over the last several years is uh, the shift into the cloud so that we allow our software to be accessible through a browser and accessible off of any device. So that's been a goal that we've been working towards. So that's one piece of what we've been doing um, with Google and with software in general is a move away from having stuff installed on different devices, but have it up in the web cloud so that it's always accessible to students and staff at any time off any device. And that's why we're so invested in Chrome and Chromebooks as well, because they work well on cloud-based environments. So there's a couple of things around that you should know. Um, one, any device basically does work. So that's great. You can use, uh, if your kids have uh, a MacBook or a PC or other things, that's one thing and it will work. Or even if you're sharing your device, as long as you're using a Chrome browser and they're signed into that browser, then everything will work well. On a Chromebook, they sign right into the Chromebook. And that Chromebook then is locked into their account when they're on it. 
And for us and for teachers working with them, it gives a very clean experience uh, for us to work with them because now they're on their one student account and it makes it a lot easier for teachers to work with them and not to be as distracted. The accounts are managed if they're an OCSB student account. That means we can provide software to the students when they're signed in on that account. If you or your student signs in on a public account, you won't get all of that. It is because they're on a managed student account that they get access to all these different types of software. And then we manage devices. So when the school board buys devices, there's another layer of management on top of it so that they we can restrict what they can do on it. So we might do certain things like, can they add other accounts or things to the device? Can we force things out to upgrade the device? Things like that, that's under our management to allow us to do that when it's a managed device. As opposed to if you get your own Chromebook, that's yours and you can control some of those things on that Chromebook because it's not managed by us. However, when your student logs in to the Chromebook with their student account, then they get all the software access and things that comes with that managed account. Okay, Bill, over to you. Yeah, thanks Rob. Yeah, there is that there is that question where uh, thanks for clarifying. I kind of bought my Chromebook, you know, at, at a local store or online and then versus the one that they maybe have um, brought home from from school for different situations and um, then just the, the account and how we protect it. Thanks for clarifying that. So what we see on our on our screen right now is the intermediate secondary student portal. That's for grades seven to twelve. And you will see that it does resemble a lot in some cases the uh, K to six portal, but it does differentiate based on the tools that are provided for that panel. For the purpose of today, another big theme that we had when we went through the questions pre-populating, and of course the feedback leading up to this, was surrounding um, workspace, um, the student dashboard, and then accessing some, um, some cards and uh, being able to submit some work. What does that user experience look like? So again, the, go, just going back to the whole goal of this session is that um, just trying to make sure that for the people who can access and the tech is working in this moment, we'll talk about what we're trying to support in the future about tech that's not working, but assuming we're in, we've accessed uh, the portal, we're signed into Chrome, that's a key piece with uh, Para, is that the student would come in and click on this icon workspace and student dashboard. So I'm kind of giving you the user experience of this. We do have a couple questions and it does link to um, passwords. And so at the, at the high school level, at the intermediate high school level, we did get some questions about kind of that password and, and students having their password and the privacy of their own password. And some of the principles and, and feedback from us from uh, parents was that, well, we're being asked to respect the privacy of passwords as per our Samaritans on the digital road pass, uh, platform and our program that goes from K to K to 12. Um, how do I kind of monitor um, that, that work with my student? How do I kind of oversee that they're doing their work? And the quick, the quick answer that we're trying to provide to our school community is to have that continued conversation with, with your child. Um, and but what we're going to show you here is something you could ask them to do if you ask them to sit down and say, okay, can you show me, you know, what timelines might be there for you to do in workspace. So that conversation piece, so it won't be you getting access to their account, which is not the goal, it would be you having that conversation like you would continue to do as parents and guardians to be able to uh, get that child to show you what it looks like. We continue to develop and look at ways to innovate the parent portal, which Rob will mention. So some of these things might tie over in the future. So what are we seeing here? This is the student who clicked on student dashboard for workspace on the student portal. At the top, they have a couple places to navigate. One is all my classes, and they will be a little bit named a little bit better than what we see here for our training classes. They, may, they would be by subject and by their class and by their school. And uh, they can toggle through and narrow down to specific classes. Um, as well as um, you can look on the left-hand side to, to do. So I'll show you multiple ways to get there, but some of the things that we are working on as we continue to build capacity across our system with Hapara Workspace is that um, using 
possible um, end dates, not as uh, definitive dates potentially, but just as ways to trigger students and help with organizational skills um, with that and time management. So when I click on to do, you can see that this student, so this is, uh, I believe uh, when I clicked on there, it was student 19, yeah, student 19. So student 19, when they go into the student dashboard, workspace yet. This is Hapara student dashboard. You can see that it kind of gives me some initial things to look at. So if you are having a conversation with your with your child and you get them to just do a couple clicks and say, okay, go to your student dashboard and click on to do, um, it will give a sense of things that are um, things that need to be done. But I will give the caveat that not all teachers and not all tasks require end dates. So I'll show you how to get into the workspace and that will be another layer of support. So just by looking at this, your child or this child, student 19, has a couple things that are due tomorrow. Now, some overlap. Um, and this is for all the classes. I can see that none are overdue. If they are overdue, they can still submit them, but it does give an indication to them that they've passed that timeline. There's eight due dates and 18 that have no due dates. That's what I was kind of referring to. Not, not all um, tasks assigned by teachers would have a due date or need to have a due date, but it's just something to narrow down to. I'm gonna narrow down to class CC training four, just for today. And I'm gonna see that this one is due tomorrow. Okay, it does highlight in a different color. It does pop out to me. So I'm going to click on that. I could, it will bring me down to where I need to go. So if the student clicks on it, it will bring you in to the uh, workspace in which you are looking at. So this is a workspace that has been created by the teacher and shared to the student. And in this case, this, these are some examples for a seven to 12 webinar. That was how I entered into this via um, the due date area. Another way that I could have done that was just I'm returning to the student dashboard and it's just loading in. If it defaults to workspace, this workspace is what some the teacher would say to the student, I want you to go to this workspace and they would know by either narrowing down by class or just by recently kind of edited that I'm gonna click on this virtual parent live stream workspace. And it's gonna bring me to the same place um, here regarding the workspace that you might be familiar with seeing on behalf of your child's experience thus far. In here, I'm in a student view. So this is not a teacher view, me being teacher. This is replicating what you might see with your child. So you're going to see a couple things. On the left-hand side, you can see a couple due dates that are tied specifically to this workspace. They're not interactive like they were on the previous one, but it does give you a sense that in this workspace, there's something that on September 29th is due on the 15th, another thing is due the 13th. It's not in order there, um, but it is there based on the cards that we have signed. The teacher, you may not see three or four columns there because the teacher uses workspace differently. Um, but when you go to submit work, we're really focused on this third column called evidence. And that's when something that if there is something that you need to do, it's a column. And you may, again, you might only see one column being evidence. You might even not see an evidence column if it's just a resource. But you will see that when you're on here, the ability to create a card and some work, usually triggered in my mind by a start button, um, would be something to do. So in this example, there are so many examples of different tasks and different learning activities that your child might be asked to do. So it's hard to give them all in um, one moment and give example that encompasses all. But I did just choose an article about what was school like 150 years ago. So the teacher may say, um, to your child, okay, I want you to read this article and then in here give some uh, a reflection of it. And it could be a Google Doc, it could be a Google Slide, and there could be some things that aren't there at all. Each card replicates the time frame. So this individual evidence I can see across the top here, it's due Friday, September 25th. Um, same here. You will notice that this card, the green card, and this pink card are actually the same activity, but I wanted to show you one thing between them before I click start, is that one says individual evidence and one says group evidence. So the teacher may have placed your child into a group um, and it may be if I click start and the other students that are paired in that group um, click start, they'll be working on the same doc. 
but it won't be your whole, whole class. It will be whoever's in that group. For today, I'm gonna to click on individual evidence. And when the student clicks start, I can see that there actually is a presentation in this and a Google Slides a document in here. When the student clicks start, it's gonna make a copy of this document for your child automatically and the, your child can start working right away. So I'm gonna do that. But I'm here um, on there and I can add text just right in here. Um, so this is not a Google session, but we did also um, get some questions about how could I insert pictures? Um, and so there are multiple levels to that and that could take um, a while uh, to look at, but um, I will address it quickly before we go back to the workspace because that's truly where we're getting a lot of questions. On the, on the left-hand side, we can click drop down and add another, um, another slide in. So essentially this, this becomes a, a Google Drive, Google Slides um, uh, experience for your child and they just work by accessing it and continuing to go back to Workspace to access it for them. Some people did ask again, like I mentioned, how do I insert pictures? Um, that's a multi-layered step. I'm gonna show you one piece of it today and another piece we're gonna work with CSPA and our um, OCSB how-to uh, micro learning videos for parents and guardians about how I might do it if I took a picture on um, an iPhone or an iPad or something like that or an Android device and, and got that in there. Because in this case, I'd be looking into how do I get it in from my Google Drive or insert that picture from uh, moving forward. So I'm gonna click on insert and you can see right the first option is upload from the computer. You might have some on there, search the web my drive, my photos, which would be Google Photos are tied to that OCSB student account. In this case, even searching the web um, allows you to search for safe images. It does say select images that you've confirmed. And we actually have the license to use because they've been tagged in a way that are copyright, uh, adjusted for copyright. And we know that if I wanted to put in uh, parliament uh, buildings and see if I have to put Canada, it already popped up in Ottawa not buildings, I can see that that picture pops up and I could just click and drag it into um, my image. And then of course I would have to adjust. The other options, just like in an email attaching, um, linking in. So when I went into insert, I could do um, from drive or from camera. I could take that picture when I'm physically in the slide and turn on my web camera and it could be a picture of me. I could put it in there. So that was some questions that we did get on the form leading into this. Um, but I could go uh, down a big rabbit hole of Google and I'm going to stop myself there. But just in the moment, um, we will look at that piece and I will return. So I'm going to close up this um, document and I'm going to go back to the workspace. You can now see on the workspace that it says submit instead of start. If I submit it, the student will then have only um, kind of read only, comment only access. So I will not be able to continue to edit it moving forward. So if I click on submit, it will say send work to the teacher. And so there's two prompts for you. So please make sure that um, the student does want to, because if not, it will go into a way where you will be able to comment and type on it, but it will not be permanent until the teacher accepts it. So just be aware from that. And then this last piece, you may see an empty box in here for Hapara. This is where you, the student, it may be go out and find something that represents um, peace. And so the, the student used different mediums, uh, different softwares, has a link, something they've created their own in Google Drive. They can drop it in here or to a link of something they've created and they can submit it. So the teacher may say the task, here's a card, the task is empty, but have, have given them instructions in a different format, maybe in this column to say what your task is and they can link it in. Bill, can you go ahead and submit that so they can see that there were questions? Absolutely, yeah. So I'm gonna submit that. And then, so now you can see that it is submitted. Uh, the teacher can send it back to you on their end of things from their piece. So there would be a communication with your teacher. But if I open it up, you can see at the top here, it's now comment only. And if I go back to my document, you can see if I start uh, trying to go into any format of trying to type, you may say, well, my document is not working. Um, what can I do? It's not giving me allowed to type in that piece. Um, so comment only um, has different features such as insert uh, comment, 
which allows the student to type in um, and maybe uh, say to the teacher, I forgot to um, add this comment in, in or some of this work, and they can leave that in the side of kind of like a, the, the margins of the uh, document. And so at least the teacher said, okay, I actually hit submit, um, but I really, I, in the moment I needed, I wanted to add that and the teacher can, can make considerations, or you could be looking for feedback. The teacher could be giving you feedback on the work. So you might see comments show up in the side there, but that's automatically occurring right now because um, I've hit submit on the workspace. If the communication goes to the teacher, oh, it was an accident, the teacher could bring it back and then you would just see submit show up again here and you find that and, and change that up. Thanks for prompting me on that, Rob. I'm gonna throw it to you on that way, just in case you think I missed any of the questions within that workspace overview. Um, no, we got we got most of them in there. A lot of them were around how do I see my child's work? How do I submit homework? So that is exactly how you do all of that. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so I'll continue to go combing through the um, the questions as well, and if we get towards the end, I'll just make sure that I address anything I feel that I, I missed in the moment. But that does, I, be I believe, just like you said, encompass kind of those basic uh, workflows that uh, the questions were addressing. So I will pass it over to you to kind of continue on um, with our agenda. And I did, you did go on mute. All right, we'll switch to me presenting. Just for a sec. This is gonna take one sec to do this. There we go. All right, so back in the slide deck real quick. Um, if you have questions, then again, the we're still monitoring that file. So if you open up another tab and go to tinyurl.com slash in capitals, OCSB, and then in lowercase, tech questions, OCSB, tech questions. So tinyurl.com slash OCSB tech questions. Then you can go there and a little form will pop up and you can enter questions if you want. And we are monitoring those. So we'll try and get to them. All right. I'm going to pop down here, though. And we're going to go to Parent Portal. So uh, you know what? I'm not going to go there. So on the Parent Portal, um, we've released just in June um, a Parent Portal because, uh, because of COVID. We're trying to go fully digital. And one of the things we've been looking to implement for some time was a way to communicate information to parents digitally. And so we've partnered with Compass for Success and uh, they have a parent portal that we're working on with them on developing uh, more and more features. So I'm gonna show it to you real quick. But one of the key things is we released it for report cards initially. So that's how we're delivering report cards. And you'll see on this slide, it says IEPs, student uh, verification information, and a bunch of other things are going digital. We're trying to remove that paper very quickly from distribution in this time frame where we don't want to be handling things and giving them to others. It's hard to clean paper. Um, so we, we're trying to avoid that kind of contact as much as possible. And we're vigorously implementing digital on this. We are very hopeful that we'll see IEPs if your child has one coming out digital. That will be through the parent portal as well. If you don't know about their parent portal, then you need to go to ocsb.ca, and that's where I am here, ocsb.ca, which is our main website, slash parent portal, and that will take you here. Um, you can also find it through the OCSB, but it's ocsb.ca slash parent portal, and that will give you information on the parent portal and how to register and get in there. So once you're in the parent portal, it's going to look something like this. And it basically gives you information um, that we keep about uh, your students and contacts so that you can retrieve that. Right now, there's no pending report card. Otherwise, you would see it on the home page, which is where we are right now. You would see, oh, you have a report card for all your children, however many you have, would be listed up top here. If teachers can, and they're allowing 
upgrades to come back ongoing, then you might see it on this page. And again, we are in our sandbox environment, so we're not uh, in your live one. And we do turn things on and off in that environment, depending. So there's some extra things in here. One of the things you've been asked to do, possibly by your school, is verify the personal information that we have so we know how to contact you, your address is correct, and things like that. You will find that by going into the parent portal and going down to this child progress area and choosing your child. Once you choose, oh, that's great. Once you choose your child, um, there's a space down here called contacts. And in contacts, it lists all the contacts that you've set up with your school to give them that information so that you can be contacted. And you'll see here that all the contacts are listed with all the different addresses and phone numbers that are important for us to get a hold of you. So it is something we go through every year and we ask parents to validate this information just to make sure these are up to date so we can contact you and have backup contacts as appropriate. As well in Parent Portal, you're gonna see things like parent resources. This is our play account, so um, don't take all of these as the ones that you're gonna see right now, but we are establishing these. So when you need information or links to go to, this is where we're gonna populate them for you as well. So it's important you get on the Parent Portal so you can get access to all this information. All right, and Bill, hopefully you're watching the questions come in just so we can do that. Yes, I am there, Rob. Okay, so the other thing that we will link into Parent Portal eventually are digital forms. So we're about to start releasing digital forms for parents. Um, if you're a new parent to our board, you would have registered recently on a digital form. So like I said, we're trying to move paper, remove paper. Over the next couple of weeks, you're gonna see digital forms being released to you. To make these work and secure them in a short term, um, we have we and we'll be putting these on the student portals for access. All of our forms basically come back connected to students, and on the student portal, um, we need their uh, them to log in securely to get access to those portals. And so on there, it's a secure environment, and it's related to your students, as are most forms. So we're going to have those forms located there, and we'll give you how to get in and access them. So the student portal, if you haven't seen it, is controlled for 7 to 12 and for K to 6 for different resources. And on here, there will be a link on the left, and it will be parent slash student forms. And there'll be a link right on this site, which is a secured site. And that's where they will be, at least temporarily. Eventually, they will be on the parent portal, but it's development and time. And we're trying to get this as quick as we can so that we can stop using paper as fast as possible. So for the interim, that's where you're gonna find them. And we'll send out more direction on that as soon as we can. Support has been a big issue and there's a lot of questions and we're about to jump into questions too. Um, just around how are we supporting? Um, we have, our support system currently in the board was designed to support in school and to support staff primarily. Um, if students and others bring things in, even if staff bring in their own devices, we're not really set up to do that well because uh, there's lots of variables in those. So it isn't something that we've had a focus on in the past. We are in discussions around, and there's lots of questions on the uh, that have come in around. My Chromebook isn't wor working perfectly. I'm doing this on a computer, but they're signed in. There's lots of questions. And it is something we started to discuss about how can we arrange to better support kids at home, especially with parents working with them. We understand it's an issue. We're trying to work on it. Um, we are stretched right now, uh, just trying to get all of these things like virtual schools running and supporting teachers with a lot of new software and uh, capabilities they haven't really dealt with before. So we are trying to get there and we're actively in discussion around how to do that. So I want to share that with you, but I don't have a promise for you yet, but we are trying to figure out how to do that better. With, especially with the staff that we have. And Bill, do you want to talk about all of our resources that are out there? And we will link these into the parent portal. So do, if you haven't gotten onto the parent portal, that's an important part because our first reporting period is coming up along with IEPs and things, and you really need to going to 
if, if you have it sharing right now, then uh, can you click on the OCSB how-to link, which is yeah. the bit.ly OCSB how-to. This is one avenue that we will uh, be looking at to post um, these these um, webinars, the resources, and uh, like I mentioned at the beginning, the micro learning videos, because we all don't have time <laughs> to watch hour long sessions all the time. Um, so this piece is a playlist um, under OCSB How To, um, and it is dedicated in this case to parents and guardians. You can see the first couple are surrounding navigating the portals um, and accessing student Hapara workspace, the student dashboards. So in this moment, if you, um, if I went a little bit too fast or you wanted to revisit that and not just through this webinar, you can see that even Rob is scrolling down a little bit about joining, joining Google Meet, using Sora to access uh, books and e-resources um, from that uh, files. Like there's a lot in there. Um, the first ones at the top are the ones we get the most questions right now as we entered into, again, virtual uh, learning and getting the school year started. So that's one great piece that we will continue and probably put this um, recording, right, uh, will be linked to YouTube in this case, but other ones that we do. Um, for CSPA, um, you might have already done this. They do have a master list of some things, but there is a, um, yeah, if you want to click on there. At the top, it is part of their uh, newsletters when it lo loads in. So monthly, um, our partnership with Ottawa Sea Spa, which is the Catholic Parents Association, up at the top there, it says subscribe to our newsletter. Now there's a lot of great information. It's not just learning technologies, but there always is a tech tip or tips um, from the learning technologies department to our partners at CSPA that usually reflect questions that are in the moment. Um, and in this past one, it was about Chrome profiles. It was about account information. Um, and you would receive those monthly um, from our partners at um, CSPA, which are, they're awesome. And they bring the voices of all parents to, to us and to make sure we're continuing to learn. And of course, um, those are some websites that you may already be familiar with, um, virtualprogram.ocsb.ca for elementary if you're on here. And of course, Rob just clicked on the 7 to 12 Virtual Academy. And you can see that there are information about the school, some frequently asked questions, the online how-tos, which are also some videos embedded from that uh, playlist, and some more information on the contact us and announcements that are, are up to date from, um, from there, which is great for us. I, I regularly go there as well, just to make sure that we're, we're on the same page um, from that. All right, before we jump into questions, is there anything I think from that support piece, Rob, that you wanted to uh, address? Or you think in terms of the main goal of this session, which was about, um, you know, getting a little overview of the things that we're doing to support student learning, and not necessarily the text uh, piece, um, which we know we need to address, as you just mentioned, is there anything we're missing? I don't think so. And I'm going to stop presenting. Okay. I think I, yeah, so you got the present. Perfect. And so we'll switch over to some of the questions real quick. Um, one of the things I wanted to highlight for folks is uh, a lot of this is new to many of our staff as well. So they're, they're preparing and going through a lot of the videos uh, as you are, as you're learning with your kids and figuring out uh, this whole virtual environment. Mm -hmm. um, they're learning too. It isn't their standard, so sometimes they are bound to make some mistakes. And one of the things, you know, that I want uh, to just emphasize a little is like, you know, they're learners too, and they are working on this. So when you catch things and stuff, you know, definitely have that conversation with your teacher if you see anything. One of the things that has happened a few times is they're sending out emails and things like that, and they forget to be CC. You know, if that ever happens, do not forward those and things. Just be sensitive that they are making mistakes and fallible too, just like all of us. So be careful. Do have that communication with them and and just be empathetic and understanding a little bit. It is hard for all of us. Uh, we've got tons of que tech questions and I know our time is running. Um, but some of the simple ones are like, okay, I have multiple kids in the same room and they all go on the meet together and then it makes funny noises. So it's simple tech questions, you know, like that are, um, how do I manage that? And one, you could put them in different rooms, but if you need to supervise them in the same space, then everybody has to be on mute basically. Um, so they have to be trained on how to turn off their audio 
so that doesn't happen. It's one mic picking up the other mic and going rounds in circles that causes that noise. The other thing to do is if you can get them headsets, they don't have to be expensive, but headsets also will help stop that. So if you can put them on a headset, it'll stop that, that loop that happens and creates all that noise. Um, there's a lot of questions around Chromebooks. So my Chromebook's not working properly. Um, I didn't get asked for a Chromebook, things like that. So if Chromebooks aren't working properly, it is something that you can report to your teacher and we will try to do that and fix that. Having said that, we have requests still coming in and we're trying to get devices out to people as fast as possible. If you didn't get within a week, it's definitely something to mention to your teacher again, because within a week, we probably should be getting those out now. I've seen the list, it's very short. So those pretty much should be out now. If there's a problem, contact the teacher and we can look at redeploying. People ask, well, I didn't get asked uh, if I wanted a Chromebook and things. So there may be, there may have been some targeted asks. It is done at the school level. And understand that we, there is no way we can supply a Chromebook for everyone. We do not have that ability to even access devices at that level because there is a high demand for Chromebooks right now and they're difficult to get. So we do have a supply that we acquired, you know, mid COVID kind of last, uh, last before summer, but those are running out and it is limited. So we are trying to get out as many as we can and I think we're going to be able to address all the people in real need. Um, if you don't really need one or if you can afford your own, then we highly encourage that because we will not be able to supply every single person with one. Um, what else yeah. are we got in here? I think you did a great job giving the overview, the overview there, Rob. Um, it just to emphasize that if there is a, a need, what would the process be to kind of, if I needed more reliable internet or a Chromebook, how would I, what would the process look like? So your teacher has is able to make those requests. And certainly we are trying to fulfill everything we can. And if you really don't have reliable internet and that's a factor, and there are a bunch of questions in here around, hey, I'm on a meet, but it's not really working. And it breaks up all the time. And there are several questions around this. There are two main factors for this. One is it could be a bandwidth factor. Um, so there is a, you can run a little thing on a device, even in Chrome called speed test, and that will show you what your bandwidth is. And if your bandwidth is five or lower, you're going to struggle with an actual video meet. So 10 is about the minimum that you would need to really function on a video call. So you can run a thing called speed test, and that will help you determine, do I have the bandwidth for this? If it's 10 or above, you should be good. If it's below, you may stagger a little. Um, the other thing that we found too is, because um, sometimes it's the teacher's fault, just saying. So depending on where they are, they may not have great internet if they're not out of school. And some of our teachers, because of medical reasons and things, may be teaching from home. Um, if they don't have the best internet, that can cause the same kind of failure. So it's something that has to be investigated. In general, hopefully like you're on here, it should be clear and good. For us right now, it's really good. I hope at home it's really good. The other piece is it can be the device. So we actually discovered, and uh, we're just working on still testing. We only discovered it this week that a certain uh, set of computers that teachers actually have are causing failure. So we're working on the fix right now, and we're trying to determine which teachers have those so that we can actually replace them. So it could be the teacher's fault too. So that's something sometimes they have to change what they're doing to actually make that work. All right, Bill, do you want to cover another question? Yeah, I think it just kind of, I've been watching the ones coming in as well. I uh, just kind of going back to your parent portal pieces that some of the features you were showing where you were talking about things that we're looking at um, making live coming very soon or moving forward. So they may not see the exact um, same that you, you were showing, but you were just kind of giving a little uh, heads up as to what should be a good user experience coming in the near future. Yeah. Um, and if they needed to change any information, there should have been verification. So that's what we're suggesting in that case. The other thing that especially a lot of kids in grades uh, 11 and 12 are really interested right now is, do I have all my credits? So again, the parent portal, you can go in there and check that. And so can your students. There is a student portal for them. They can also do the same thing. If your student, if you're in grade 12 and your student turns 18 this year, you actually get cut off from access. That is the law. 
unless they sign a piece of paper, okay, don't have that form digitized yet, to allow you to actually access their information. Once they turn 18 legally, we have to cut it. So unless they've actually approved it and they've contacted the school and said, no, let my parents access this, then they're the ones that are going to get the report card and everything themselves. So just be aware if you're in grade 12 that that is important. They can go onto the portal, ask can you, and look at the actual credit accumulation. It's in both portals. Thanks, Robin. Um, I am uh, respective of time for those people that are, are still on the live stream, um, but I, I feel that we can, since it's being recorded, that we could probably fin finish up a couple of questions. And if um, the, the parents that are busy um, need to come back to look at, it, at least we've addressed the questions as opposed to um, ending it early. Um, are you okay to stay on for a few mo for a few more moments? Okay, perfect. We can stay on for a few um, minutes, minute. and and we will post this. And the other thing is, if these types of meetings that are direct to parents are important, and you find that this is a useful thing, I mean, one you can throw it in the comments if you like on on the questionnaire, and just give us feedback about that, um, because we are. This is a new format for us. We haven't tried to go live out to parents um, regularly or ever in our department. So if it's something that you want to see us continue to do, then do give us feedback. There was a little bit, but certainly that lets us know that this is, you want some kind of interactive format, you know, from different departments, just let us know and we can try and continue to do that. Yeah, and I know that our Spec Ed Student Services Department put on a webinar through CSPA yesterday talking about how do I support my students with their online learning and just kind of that behavior component to it. So we are listening. Um, we are trying to adapt. Um, nobody um, going back to before last March uh, would have imagined that um, as being an educator, as a parent, that this is the what it would look like coming um, this September. And we're all adapting and definitely uh, doing our best to uh, teach virtually online and to support us all together in this piece. Um, I guess I'm looking at my themes there, Rob, and one of them was around scheduling. Um, and I think that maybe ties in a little bit to your uh, prompt just about devices and all being on the same time. Uh, the quick answer is I'm sure you can imagine that in a perfect world, it'd be great to have that sort of that um, set schedule for each family, but we can appreciate that everybody's set schedule for each family within a class is looks different. Um, and I know that the classroom teacher is trying to, within the hours and within the school day, trying to best accommodate and be uh, clear about what that schedule is. But right now there are so many factors um, um, within, I know at seven to 12, we're looking a bit, <laughs> a bit different than what our elementary uh, uh, partners are, are looking at. But just knowing that um, that schedule is there, and then the way and when and when and where they're online and being tasked with something is just is something we're trying to address and and to bring forward uh, as well, um, so that if you don't you need to be online with three kids, uh, it's something that we can try to work in from that parental perspective. And maybe we'll bring in Dave for fun because Dave is on, and there are some tougher questions that aren't tech questions, and they are in there. We said we wouldn't really touch this, but it might be good to address a couple. So we have several questions around French or I haven't seen my French teacher and things like that. So there's some questions in there like that. So maybe we could throw those out. Um, the other one is about assessment. So now that my kids are online, what's assessment really look like? How are we guaranteeing this? And then are we going to be able to apply for university and things like that? So there's some stress, I think, on the grade 12 parents out there just wondering about this kind of year. Yeah, we'll introduce Dave. You said Dave, but we didn't say he was on the call, but maybe you can introduce yourself, Dave. Thanks for thanks for being here. Thanks, Bill, and thanks, Rob. My name is Dave Nash, and I'm the principal of the grades 7 through 12. So currently we have about 3,000 kids in grade 9 to 12 and about 1,500 kids in grades 7 and 8. So do you want me to, I, I know there was a question about scheduling. Do you want me to address that first? Or, yeah. Or yeah, I mean, they're seeing there. There are uh, questions around. Oh, my kids are scheduled double time. Like, how is that working? And like, so they're. I'm just saying those are some of the questions that are out there. Um, certainly, they're they're curious also about the French scheduling and when is that starting and why haven't I seen a French teacher? Um, and then assessment is the other big one. Okay, so so first to address the scheduling um, in the. Uh... In the intermediate, in, in both of our panels, we have uh, 170 teachers and 170 teachers from across the system. 
they're all working out of their home schools unless they have a, an accommodation to work from their home. Uh, each of these home schools has different start times. Some are as early as 8 a.m. and some are as late as 8.45. So these teachers are planning their day sometimes around the homeschool schedule that at the school that they're working at because they have supervision responsibilities as well at that school. And sometimes they're planning their schedule around their, uh, their conversations with their students in terms of best fit. And if they're an intermediate teacher, sometimes they're planning their schedule around when that French teacher is coming into their virtual classroom to provide French instruction for them. Um, so again, that's now speaks to the French question. In the intermediate panel, you have uh, core classes that are receiving French instruction of 50 minutes once a day. And so a French teacher will be going into six different virtual classrooms over the course of the day to provide French blocks. So that means that that grade seven, eight teacher now has to organize his or her day around that French timetable. So that may dictate when they're teaching their math or their English or their science because the French teacher has said, I need to come in at this time and I need to exit at this time because I need to go into five other classrooms. Uh, that's core. We have immersion classrooms as well at the grade seven, eight level. And those teachers, those kids are getting 50% of their instruction in French, either in the morning or afternoon, and then 50% of their instruction in English in the morning and afternoon. So you would have an English immersion teacher that would in fact have two classes. They would teach one class in the morning, and then they would teach another class in the afternoon, and they would be co-teaching with a French teacher again that would have two classes, one in the morning, and one in the afternoon, and then those two teachers would flip between those classes together. So I hope that answered some of the questions about scheduling for French. It's, it's certainly not easy at the intermediate level because you have your core classes and your immersion classes. Um, you also have the fact that in grades seven, eight, uh, you have teachers that have traditionally taught uh, specialty subjects. For example, a grade seven and eight teacher that has just taught math or just taught phys ed. Uh, so now these teachers have, have made arrangements with their colleagues and so forth for, for one teacher maybe to cover different maths for another virtual teacher and, and trade off their Englishes and things like that. So that now we're, we're creating and we're refining our virtual environment. So we have specialty teachers at the intermediate level for those kids, which I think has always been best practice for us and for the benefit of the kids as well, because they're not teaching outside of their, their specialty area at the 7-8 level. So what do you think about assessment and how are kids doing assessment, especially in practical courses like biology or chemistry where, um, you know, normally that's more hands on and things. So how is that working this year? Any teacher in the province of Ontario has to follow growing success. That's the provincial assessment and evaluation document. Uh, they have to triangulate between three different things, student product, observation, and conversation and that's how they're going to equate their mark. Um, there may be some challenges with the virtual environment and, and as Bill said earlier we're, we're, we're figuring that out and we're making our way through it and it's, it's getting better every day. I can tell you that we're having a pop-up staff meeting tonight at 2.40 and one of our consultants that deals specifically with assessment and evaluation, Rob Kopp, is going to be speaking with all of our teachers about assessment and evaluation, specifically at the high school level where this concerns RST, which are rich summative tasks. So if there's any real issues, your teachers, your point of contact, so definitely go to them and talk to them first. And, and remember, they're learning as we are. So, and as your kids are and going through this. So any last words, Bill or Dave? No, I think you summed it up nicely and there's still lots for us to address, but the feedback has been great that we are putting these on and we will continue to look at ways to get, get information out um, that are being requested on the forum. So thank you for everybody for joining. Thanks Dave for being here and Rob, thanks for uh, co-facilitating. And I've just posted up that URL in case people want to add anything to our questions or comments and just throw it up on there and then we will take that feedback. So thank you everybody for joining. I'll leave this up for a sec so everybody can see it. I'm just gonna turn off my audio. Thanks everyone.
Guys, thank you very much. Thanks so much, Dave. Appreciate it. Yeah, okay, thank, thank you. Care. I'm going to leave that posted for a minute so everybody has that URL if they need it. Okay, yeah, I'll go off and then a few minutes, um, I'll uh, exit that call.